Let me run a scenario by you. Your name is John and you're trying to apply for jobs. So you find this service called Interview Pro because everything has pro in the name today. You connect with them and they want to schedule a meeting. Now, they don't want to have to ask you for your availability. So they want access to check your calendar. And from there, they just want to see when you have an available slot. So they could go the easy route and ask you for your username and password. But would you really give them your password? Let's say that you agreed to give them your password, but now they can, they're going to log in as you with Google and they can see your photos. There's no way you can limit what they can do. Now, believe it or not, back in the day, this is what companies did. This sets us up for the problem we want to solve, namely that you, John, can authorize Interview Pro to look at your Google Calendar and just that without giving Interview Pro your password. All right, so now that you understand the problem that we're trying to solve, let's switch gears. You're no longer John, you're now Interview Pro, okay? So you wanna build a way for users to be able to connect their Google account to your service so that you, Interview Pro, can go and look at their calendars and find an available slot. Introducing OAuth, that is exactly the purpose of OAuth. We're going to be looking at the flow in this video and in the second part, we're going to be implementing that through code. The whole purpose of the flow that we're going to demonstrate now is to obtain an access token. An access token is something that Interview Pro ourselves will take to Google and say, hey, give me my calendar. Here's an access token. All right. So now that you understand the problem we're going to solve, let's look at the flow. The flow will require that you have a client ID and a client secret. Remember, we're Interview Pro. Before we can access anybody's calendars or data or anything, we have to go to Google and register with them. So Google is going to say, okay, I created this ID for you. This is ID is going to identify your app, Interview Pro. So that's called the client ID. And here's a secret for you. This secret is going to, you're going to need it for later in the flow. I'm going to explain that. All right, guys. So in this diagram, we have John in the middle. John is the resource owner according to OAuth terminology, because he's the owner of the calendar, the calendar being the resource. The client is gonna be Interview Pro. So, so don't confuse the client uh, in OAuth with you know, like the browser or something like that. We are the client because to Google, which is the authorization server, we are the client requesting that to Google on behalf of John. All right, so let's jump into the flow. What the browser in John's machine is going to do is going to come to Interview Pro and it's going to say, hey, I want to connect, you know, my Google account to, to you. Interview Pro, and I'm going to mark responses with a blue color. Interview Pro is going to say, all right, go to this URL. So it's going to redirect John's browser to Google. So John's browser is going to come to Google and Google is going to respond with a login screen. It's going to be a login screen now once he logs in uh, he's going to submit that and google is going to show him a consent oof i'm terrible at drawing a consent screen once he consents he submits that consent to google and google will say all right go back to interview pro what you see here is just to redirect Okay, so John is gonna go back to Interview Pro and now Interview Pro at this stage, let's just simplify for a second, is gonna have access to John's account. This is the flow in a nutshell. I'm gonna expand it in a second, but just so far it's important you understand that the reason that this is secure from John's standpoint is that he is not giving his password, as you can see here, he's submitting his login information to Google. Right, and then Google shows him a consent screen and then he submits the consent to Google. And then Google will say, all right, you're done here. Go back to Interview Pro. So let's drill a little deeper here. Let's go here. So John says to Interview Pro, I wanna connect my Google account with you. Interview Pro in this response is just gonna redirect John's browser to Google. When we construct this URL here that he's gonna be sent to, we're gonna pass in some parameters for this flow. The first one is gonna be your client ID. So when you're gonna start this flow, you say you're basically telling Google, hey, get me an access token for client you know, interview pro. You also need to pass in the redirect URI. 
which is basically when the flow is done here, after he has consented and the flow is done, where do you send them back to? All right, so it's gonna be this URL here. So this URL that he's gonna be sent to is gonna come from the beginning here. Next, you're gonna pass in scopes. So this is what are you gonna be allowed to do with the token? Then there are two more things that you could pass in. State, which is something that Google is gonna send back here, right? So you, you put it here, it comes, and then it comes all the way back to you here. Uh, we'll see an example of that later. And then you can pass in the response type. In this case, we're gonna pass in code, and I'll explain what that means just now. This is actually very important. So this is what we're gonna talk about next. So what does Google send here, right? Okay, he has consented. All right, so Google is gonna send him back to the redirect URI that we specified in the beginning. And what is that URI gonna receive? What parameters? The state? And now you would probably say, okay, so you're gonna receive the access token here, right? You completed the flow, you have the access token, and then you can just, you receive the access token here, and then you can just use that access token to query the calendar. If that is your guess, you would be wrong, okay? That is the case in a flow called implicit flow, all right? So I'm passing in code here. But if it's an implicit flow, yes, you would be receiving an access token here, okay? Instead, what you receive is a code. This code comes back to you. The, so this is the redirect request. So as that comes, you forward it along to the API. Now the API has the code. What the API is gonna do is, API is gonna use that code and make a request to Google, passing in the code. And Google is gonna reply to the API, to Interview Pro, with the access token. The point of this code is ultimately for the API to receive that code and exchange it for an access token and get the access token from Google. All right, so now you might be wondering why didn't Google just send to us the access token here? Why make CAS do this extra step? So that is what would happen if instead of code, you use the implicit flow. So here, instead of code, you would have sent token, okay? Then at the end, you would receive the token. This is a discourage flow. It's kind of deprecated, you shouldn't use it, and we'll see why. So let's go back. You don't, you don't pass in token, you pass in code. Now, the reason that you do this is because if you pay attention to my diagram here, this exchange of a code for an access token is not going through the browser, okay? This entire flow here, that's going through the browser, but this flow here is not. So the point is that you do not know what is happening here, right? You don't control the browser. You don't control, this could be a mobile phone as well. You don't, you don't have a, a lot of a formal control over that. I mean, you, the, the, maybe the user has installed an extension. You don't know, that's the point. The, the point is that, yes, you control this and this is secure because you're using HTTPS here, okay? So it's secure, it's not a, it's not a bad channel, it's not an insecure channel. But this is, you have less control over this channel, of, over this channel of communication. So technically, for instance, if you, this code that is sent here, you know, an extension could pick it up, you know, someone would see it in the, in the address bar, you could leak this code, right? And that's fine, that's fine. Why? Because, and here's the key, here's the key to the extra step, along, in order to exchange this code for an access token, what do you need to pass in? I just put in code here, but you actually need to pass in your client ID and your client secret. Otherwise you can't exchange that code. So this solves our problem, right? Because what if somebody steals this code here? You know, the, when the user is redirected, there's some extension, something happens, somebody sees the address bar, takes a picture and tries to exchange that code before you, they can't they don't have your secret. But because this is your API, this is not something, you know, you have complete control over what's installed here. You have, you are the owner of this, right? 
you don't need to put that secret in the browser or the mobile apps because someone could you know, reverse engineer your mobile apps or someone could just inspect the JavaScript in your browser. Even if someone were to steal this code, they could not use it. It'd be worthless to them because they don't have the secret. This division that we're doing here, this first part of the flow where everything is happening through the browser, you go to interview pro, it comes back to you, it sends you to Google, it comes back to you, shows you the screen, you go back to Google, sends you a consent screen, you go back to Google, Google sends you back to Interview Pro. This whole thing is happening on the browser. Okay, so this is what is known as a front channel in the docs. It's secure and it's fine. It's just you don't have as much control. But here, this is a server to server communication. Hopefully you control your server, you own this, and you trust that Google is doing a good job. So this is what is known as a back channel, right? So we don't expose the access token on the front channel, only the code, but that's fine because no one can use that code unless they have your client secret. So this is the, the most common approach to using OAuth with a response type of code. Like I said before, you could not use code, you could use token instead. And then you would not get a code here, you would just get this access token sent to you to the browser here. When do you use that? Well, you could use that if you don't have a backend, right? So if you don't have this, well, then you don't have a choice. But in that case, there's an extension to the OAuth protocol called PKCE, Puxy, or something like that. And I'll go into detail on that in a future video, okay? So we've covered OAuth. OAuth, remember, is for authorization. Now you might come to me and say, hey, but I've seen OAuth being used for authentication. Sign up with Google or sign up with Facebook. So, um, so if you're building an app, the user can create their account with an email or password or they can just sign up using their Google account. How come? Because that's an authentication scenario, okay? But OAuth is built for authorization. So yeah, uh, OAuth was a very successful protocol. And what happens is that it started to be used that way. So let's look at how, okay? So we're back in my tablet and pay attention to this, right? When you want to connect your accounts, Google is going to ask you to log in, all right? So you are authenticating with Google. And now imagine that in the scopes of the things that you want access to is the person's profile. So now you have access to their profile, meaning maybe their email, their first name, last name, whatever. This list of scopes is, is not standardized, depends on the app. So imagine that Google exposes a scope that says profile, and that is what you request. You could come to Google and say, hey, give me, this, give me John's profile information. And then you would get John's first name, last name, and everything. Because they had to log in in Google, and because they, had to, uh, they granted you access to their profile, it, you could technically authenticate uh, John in that way. Sign them up, you could just grab the profile information and just register him in your app without making him rewrite you know, for his first name, his last name. The problem is that this is not standard now. Maybe, you know, Google has a profile scope. Let's say that Facebook also has a profile scope. When you retrieve the profile, you know, Google uses a certain endpoint and Facebook uses a different endpoint and Google, you know, calls the last name, you know, family name and Facebook calls it last name. This is not standardized information. It works, but it's not ideal. We need to solve that. And the way that that was solved is through the creation of the OpenID standard. What the OpenID standard does is, it's not a replacement of OAuth. In fact, it works on top of OAuth and it provides a scope called OpenID. So when you add this scope, it also dictates, okay, you're gonna have a specific endpoint where you can go get the profile information that will have a specific format. So it's just a way of all of us getting together and saying, all right, we're gonna standardize, you know, the name of the scope, the endpoint where you're gonna go fetch the profile, what the profile will have, things like that. The flow is now complete. I'm missing two flows uh, still because I, I believe I mentioned the authorization code flow 
and the implicit flow. I'm missing the resource owner password credentials flow and I'm missing the client credentials flow. Client credentials is more for like your API wants to access its own resources. All right, so, but I'm not gonna cover that in this video. That is coming up in the next video. All right guys, so this is everything I had for you today. I hope that you liked it and it was useful to you. Do not forget to hit like and subscribe and turn on notifications if you wanna see more of that. So that should be right there. Remember that this video was part of my Explain Like I'm 5 series. I had the TLS video. You should probably see it there. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. I hope this was useful and that you learned something. I'm gonna tackle the rest of OAuth in an, in an upcoming video. I just wanna keep this video from being too long. So I'll see you guys in the next one and I hope to see you again.